So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And that's our reading for today. Whether you're a Christian or not, Jesus changed the world. He changed how we live and how we think. And him coming into the world was a turning point in human history, no matter how you look at it. And there's a lot of values that we take for granted. And here, simply because Jesus was born. In this passage here, maybe you noticed, but this is what you might call a get-along passage where Paul is speaking to a church in Philippi and he's saying to everybody, guys, get along. Come on, work together, be of the same mind, be cooperative, have a, be on similar mission, have a similar focus. You guys can, you guys can do this. You, have, you all have Christ. And so you need to put on Christ. You need to think like him. So this is a get along message to the church. And getting along was a really difficult thing in the early church. You can tell because there's a get along message in pretty much every book of the Bible. Uh, or every book of the New Testament at least. Um, Christians are from different backgrounds. We have different personalities. We think differently about things. And so coming together requires a focus on who Jesus is. And that's what this is about. In verse 5, it says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Have, have this mind. Have this thinking. Have this thought pattern. Christians must have the mind of Christ. In the, in the Greek here, it's actually a command. Think. Think like Christ. We need to have that mind of, of Christ. We need to think like him. We need to see the world as him. We need to have similar thoughts and priorities as he did. And then after that command, he goes into, this is, this is what Jesus did. And the first thing he mentions is that the thinking of Jesus, Jesus Christ, his thinking was not to hold tightly to being God. So you almost have a picture here of Jesus holding on to all of the things that make him God you know, being everywhere at once, being all-knowing, and being all-powerful, and he could have just hung on to that. And instead of just hanging on to that and grasping it, he decided to let it go, to become one of us. And he had to embrace the, the weakness and the frailty and the mortality that we have all the time. So he let it go. Before being born of the Virgin Mary, he was the Son of God with all the privileges and position that that went with. And he decided to become one of us. Verse 7, it talks about and he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. It's almost like if you had this, this big picture full of divine attributes. The, the, the wording here is that he took that and he poured himself out so that he would have none of it anymore to become one of us. He, he emptied himself. So instead of being all-knowing, he assumed the intelligence of an infant. He needed his diaper changed. He had to learn to walk and speak. He designed the universe, but he had to learn basic math skills. Um, 
it's just, I think of, it says he was wrapped in swaddling cloths, you know, so he was bound together real tightly like this. And it's just, it's just what, a, what a contrast to go from being in heaven with all that power and authority to not even be able to move in your arms. That was a picture of what he took on because of us. So that was his thinking. God's thinking is to empty and to serve. He thought it was good to go from God to slave. It says servant there, but the better translation is slave. He became a slave. He was in the form of God, and then he took the form of slave. God, slave. Not even just human, but slave. He came here to serve us. He was here to serve. He existed for our benefit. He didn't exist for himself. He existed here on earth for our benefit. He came into a world where slavery was everywhere, actually. Pretty much the whole ancient world, everywhere, Everybody had slaves. There was slavery everywhere. In fact, I challenge you to find a, a society or culture that didn't have slaves. I don't think one exists, at least not that I could find. This is a picture of, of some slaves serving some masters in ancient Rome here. But it was everywhere in the ancient world. No, but it didn't occur to anybody that slavery shouldn't exist. It was just the way it was. There were people who you owned and that served you. And that's just the way it was. Nobody thought anything of it. Slavery was practiced in Egypt, Nubia, China, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, Carthage, India, and the Americas here, Native Americans here. It was in Europe, Middle East, Korea, elsewhere. Um, the oldest law code that was ever discovered from Hammurabi um, had lots of provisions about slavery. Um, the word used for slavery here in the New Testament was, was so common, written in the ancient world, that it wouldn't have occurred to anybody that this would refer to somebody who's just a servant who serves you freely and could quit any time. No, if this word that it's described for Jesus here, this meant... You were owned by somebody. You can't just quit whenever you want. Slaves were treated as less than human. Slaves were legally classified as commodities. They were things to own. They were, they were objects in the legal system. To be a slave was itself considered by many Romans to be not fully human. And they weren't treated very well. Um, Roman law just envisioned the life of a slave as equivalent to an animal put to work by its owner. So we don't have a lot of laws governing the treatment of animals, maybe a couple. That would be the similarity with, with slaves. Much of the historical material on slaves and what we know about it is actually anecdotal. Nobody wrote about slavery, really. It's just in passing it's mentioned. It was just common, and nobody really cared about slaves enough to even really talk about them much. So it was really considered beneath the dignity of a historian to talk about the lives of slaves. Um, one of ancient philosopher Aristotle put it this way, nor is there any friendship towards a horse or cow or towards a slave. You can't be friends with a, a horse or a cow or a slave because that's the similar category there. Slaves faced the worst kinds of treatment. Masters wanted to get the most work out of their slaves. You know, if this is an object that you own, you want to get the most out of this, this object, if you will. Um, but slaves were considered naturally lazy and they were thought to take advantage of being gentle. So you had to be harsh with them. You had to crack the whip, literally. And you had to remind them who was boss. 
And so slaves were naturally treated poorly. Slave testimony in court was not admissible unless the slave was under torture at the time because they figured that they were not reliable unless they were under torture. Um, and one of those tortures was uh, to be flogged, which is, happened to Jesus right before he was crucified. Um, slaves that tried to escape could expect a beating or crucifixion or being sold to fight as a gladiator, which meant certain death. This was the slave condition. Slaves were the lowest class in society. Again, this is an honor-shame culture. People want respect. People want honor. People want recognition as, as having a place in society. And if you were a slave, you got no recognition. Nobody, nobody really cared that you existed. Nobody took your opinion seriously. You couldn't vote or anything like that. You just were owned by somebody and you had to simply do what they said. Now, there were some highly trained slaves who were prized and, very, and treated very well, um, but slaves had the least amount of respect in Roman society and pretty much most societies. Their whole world was serving their master. That was their world. And so that was their entire life. They didn't have any thoughts on anything beyond that. So it's hard to, it's hard to fully paint a picture of, of what slavery was like in, in the ancient world because it's, it's so foreign to us now. But this was just normal to these people. This was common. This is what you did. And we serve the God who voluntarily became a slave. That's what Philippians is trying to say. We serve a God who voluntarily, on purpose, intentionally became a slave. The lowest of society. The one who has the least amount of respect. The one who exists to serve somebody else. <coughs> This notion would have baffled any Roman. Any Roman would have thought themselves too, too important to become a slave. You only did that if you absolutely had to. In fact, most slaves were taken as, as prisoners of war and then they were sold and when they were brought back. So most people were not a slave voluntarily. You didn't do that. Who in their right mind would join the most shameful ranks in society? This would, this would just make no sense. Again, honor, shame, culture. You want honor. You don't want shame. Why would you join this, the, the class of people that have the most shame? That makes no sense. And especially when Jesus, when he was on earth... He had the right to every honor and privilege that we could possibly give him. When the Son of God comes to you as one of you, he, we should have been bowing down before him. We should have given him the best food and the best lodging. We should have given him the highest honors that we possibly could have. He deserved everything good that we could give him. He deserved it all. And he accepted none of it. The Son of God is greater than any earthly position. He's so powerful that he can even control the weather. It was a storm and he told it to stop. We, you know, we should be bowing in front of this person. He can literally walk on water. We owe our very existence to him. It says everything that was made came through him. So that's you and me. We owe our existence to him. He had the right to every honor and privilege, and yet he made his entire life about saving us from our sinful condition. He had the right to be honored and respected in every way possible, and he accepted none of that. He came to exist to save us from sin. He claimed none of his rights. 
He taught us the way of true life according to God's commands. He taught us he healed every sickness and disease. He gave his life on the cross to atone for our sins. He was never concerned about what he received. He always lived to give. That is the mind of Christ. And that is what Philippians is saying. You guys need to have that among yourselves. What Jesus did, though, here was he turned common service into the most honorable lot in life. Of all of the, the lot that you could have in life, of any, of any situation that you could find yourself in, serving others is now the most honorable. He made it honorable to serve. He turned society where slavery was at the bottom and the emperor was at the top, he turned that upside down. So now the highest honor is to serve. It says in Mark 10, 42 through 45, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. He put it straightforward right there. The Gentiles do things this way. Among you, it's going to be this way. 1 Corinthians 7.22, Paul talking to slaves here. He who is called in the Lord as a slave is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who is free when called is a slave of Christ. If you were a slave, you are free. And if you are free, then you are Christ's slave. There's a reversal there. Service is the highest honor. Because if the Son of God does it, then it's honorable. He defines what's honorable. So if you have a job that means humble service of some kind, if you think that your job is a kind of a humble job where you have to serve other people, doing some things that maybe you'd rather not do, take pride in your work. Take pride in that work. This is the kind of work that Jesus did when he came here. He did the work of a slave. He existed to serve us. This is honorable. So do your best work because the Son of God took this route. So if your job is one of humble service, do your best work. Take pride in that work. Do it to the best of your ability. You are not on the bottom rung of society. You're on the top. This is what Jesus changed. You're not on the bottom. You're on the top. And if you are being served, treat that person with dignity and respect. They're not just an object that you can use. They are doing something that's honorable. Let's not look at service of that kind as the world does. Let's see it for the honorable lot that Christ made it. For Christians, serving others is a privilege, not a punishment. It's an honor to be able to serve one another. And if you look at (laughs) if you look at the way that so many New Testament letters begin, Paul, a servant of Christ, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, Paul, a servant of God, James, a servant of God, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, Jude, a servant of of Jesus Christ or revelation the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants the things must that must soon take place he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John okay all of the apostles identify themselves as servants and again better translated slave it's an honor to be a slave in Christ's economy And you can see that all of the New Testament writers are identifying as such. 
That's who I am. This is what Christ was. This is who I am now. Look at the screen here. Let's answer this together. What does God require of you in this eighth commandment? That I do whatever I can for my neighbor's good. That I treat others as I would like them to treat me. And that I work faithfully so that I may share with those in need. We treat people as we would want to be treated because Christ has changed the entire economy of things. So even at the very beginning in the New Testament, from the beginning, slave and free were spiritual equals. And this would make no sense to a common Roman, but this was the way it was. Whether if you were coming to church and you were a slave, you had the same spiritual caliber and credibility as anyone else did. You were, you were equal in the church. Colossians 3.11 Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Making that, if before God, we're all the same. In front of God, we're all the same. None of us is closer to God by any of these qualities. So there were spiritual equals. And this was true at the very beginning. Now, unfortunately, there were Christians that owned slaves, even at the very beginning. And even worse, there were Christians that defended slavery as an institution and said this was a good thing. However, as the message of Jesus got out farther and farther, wherever the message of Christianity spread, slavery began to fade. That's how, that's how it worked. Setting slaves free was a Christian pattern. Christians were doing that. In the 5th century, there was a wealthy woman named Melania. She liberated 8,000 slaves and decided to live a life of Christian asceticism. Um, there was a guy named Hermes who became a Christian during the Emperor Hadrian, and he freed 1,250 slaves on Easter. This was, these were just some of the more prominent examples, but Christians started to free their slaves. There are spiritual equals. I shouldn't own them. I should release them. And so this... And, you have to imagine how much money these people are out by just releasing these slaves. That's a ton of money. But they were convicted and they decided to release those slaves. By the 12th century, slavery in Europe was rare. By the 14th century, it was almost unknown. As Christianity took over in Europe, slavery disappeared. Slavery was revived when Europeans began trading along the African coast. The Africans had slaves, and so Europeans who were trading there bought slaves in Africa. And then slavery became common again. Soon buying slaves from Africa and selling them elsewhere became big business. And unfortunately, Christians and churches participated in that. Across all different kinds, by the way. But slavery is outlawed today because Christians thought this was wrong. There were these Christians who grew to be more and more and more and said, you know what, slavery is just wrong. We need to stop it. It needs to be outlawed. It was people following Jesus who successfully pushed to outlaw slavery. It wasn't the secular world. It was Christians, people following Jesus, who became a slave, made it an honorable lot, who said, you know what, this system is, is messed up. First it was the Quakers, then it was John Wesley and the Methodists, and then it spread out from there. Britain was first to outlaw slavery in 1833, with a campaign by devout Christian William Wilberforce. Today, slavery is outlawed in every country of the world. 
because of Christians, people following Jesus. He changed the world. He changed the way we think about things. Unfortunately, slavery is, and the laws against slavery are not enforced everywhere. There's a lot of people who are paid with bribes to look the other way, and so slavery is quite prominent now today in many places in the world. But it is outlawed in every place in the world. Let's end on this note. Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross, the lowest that you could go. And because of that, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, so that one day every knee will hit the ground when they see Jesus Christ coming on the clouds with great power and glory. Because Jesus humbled himself, God exalted him. And the same goes for us. If you humble yourself, if you serve, if you don't buy into the world's ways of doing things, you will be exalted as well. This is the mind of Christ that we are to have among ourselves. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son, Lord Jesus. Thank you for coming. Thank you for giving up all of your, your powers and your privileges to be one of us, to be like us in every way except for sin. Lord, help us to follow that example, to have that mind in ourselves, not the mind of advantage or gain, but the mind of, of service and helping others. But Lord, this is, this is against our, our natural way of things, so please equip us by your Holy Spirit to do what is right and good for other people. We pray everything in Jesus' name. Amen.